been prosecuted or I don't know where it is now. But when you see that, I thought it was an insult to our country and it shouldn't happen. And uh, we'll see what what goes on there. But uh, that was a uh, that was a horrible aberration. Uh, these are the I guess the, the same Mueller people that put everybody through hell. And uh, I think it's a disgrace. No, I have not been involved with it at all. Would you consider commuting or? I don't want to talk about that now. I think it was a disgraceful recommendation. What do you think? They ought to be ashamed of themselves. What, what, what they've done to General Flynn, what they've done to others, and then the really guilty ones, people that have committed major crimes are getting away with it. Uh, I think it's a disgrace. Let's see what happens. Go ahead, John. I was going to say, Mr. President, you took on uh, Michael Bloomberg and Brad Parscale did as well over stop and frisk. Yet in 2016 and 2018, you praised Rudy Giuliani for the stop and frisk program. So what's different about what Bloomberg said from what you believe the program Well, I'll tell you what, I looked at it and I watched him pander at a church and practically begged for forgiveness. I wouldn't have begged for forgiveness. I mean, he was doing his job at the time. And then he, when he went up to the church, uh, I thought it was disgraceful. Uh, but I put something out and it was so, it was pretty nasty. And I thought, you know, I'm looking to bring the country together, not divide the country further. But uh, when he went up to a church and he apologized for everything he's ever done, that was only for getting votes. And I think probably people understand that. Yeah, please. Mr. President, you are traveling to India later this month. I am. Can you tell us something about the Prime Minister Modi? And it's going to be very, I don't know who's going, but it's, he said we will have millions and millions of people. My only problem is, so last night we probably had 40 or 50,000 people, far more than anyone else. But when we have 50,000 people nowadays, yeah. fellas, I'm not going to feel so good because he thinks we'll have five to seven million people just from the airport to the, uh, to the new stadium. And you know, it's the largest stadium in the world. He's building it now. It's almost complete. And it's the largest in the world. And he's a friend of mine. He's a great gentleman. And I look forward to going to India. So we'll be going at the end of the month. Do you plan to sign a trade deal with the Indians when you uh, travel? We'll do something and we'll see if we can make the right deal. We'll do it. Mr. President, do, do you know who Anonymous is? I don't want to say, uh, but you'd be surprised. Would you be surprised? But I don't want to say. And can you talk a little bit more about some of the recent departures from the White House, including the Vindman twins and, no, and, and, and pending departures? I obviously wasn't happy with the job he did. First of all, he reported a false call that wasn't what was said on the call. What was said on the call was totally appropriate, and I call it a perfect call. I always will call it a perfect call. Uh, and it wasn't one call. It was two calls. There were two perfect calls. Uh, there was no setup. There was no anything. And he reported it totally differently. And then they all went wild when I said that we have transcripts of the calls, and they turned out to be totally accurate transcripts. And if anybody felt there was any changes, we let them make it, because it didn't matter. Uh, so we had accurate, totally accurate transcripts, and it turned out that what he reported was very different. And also, when you look at Vindman's, uh, the person he reports to, said horrible things, avoided the chain of command, leaked. Uh, did a lot of bad things. And so we sent him on his way to a much different location, and uh, the military can handle him any way they want. Uh, General Milley has him now. I congratulate General Milley. Uh, he can have him. Uh, but uh, And his brother also. So we'll, we'll find out what happened. I mean, we'll find out. But he reported uh, very inaccurate things. You understand that, John. When you look at his report, and then when you look at what actually the exact words, Fortunately, I had the words, because otherwise we would have had a lot of people lying, and uh, we were able to do it. So fortunately, we had transcripts of those calls. I think you guys all agree with that, right? Yes, Wasn't it nice? It After they said these horrible things and made up these horrible, horrible lies about what was said in the call, and then I said, here's the call. I had a transcript. If I didn't have a transcript, it would have been my word against their word. But there were other people on that call, too. Many people on that call, Mike Pompeo, and I know that when I speak to the head of state of countries, presidents, prime ministers, etc., there are always a lot of people on those calls, especially from the other countries, I imagine. I don't know that for a fact, but I know for a fact that we have a lot of people on those calls. Who would say something wrong? I wouldn't say it wrong anyway, but who would say it wrong when you have, when a call is loaded up with, you know, sometimes as many as 25 people, sometimes as, as many as three or four or two, but there's always people on those calls. I, I fully know that. Uh, but that was a perfect call, and it wasn't reported the way it was reported, like, oh, it was so terrible. That was a very nice call. That was a very friendly call. Uh, a couple of things. The president, as you know, of, of Ukraine stated very strongly that there was no pressure. There was no anything. There was nothing wrong. 
And uh, it was really a very sad state of affairs that our country wasted that much time on nothing, on nothing. And I want to thank our three senators that are here for, for <coughs> agreeing with me. Are, are there I mean, you had one to... grandstander. He's always been a grandstander. Are there more departures to come? <clears throat> oh, sure. Oh, sure. Absolutely. When you say that, up. when you when you say that the military can deal with Vinman any way that they want, are you yeah, no, well, are you suggesting he, he should now, face? He's, he's over with the military. Do you think he needs to face disciplinary yeah, action? It's going to be up to the military. We'll have to see. But if you look at what happened, I mean, they're going to certainly, I would imagine, take a look at that. But no, I think uh, what he did was just reported a false call. If you look at what he said, and then. And I'll tell you, you the one worse was uh, you look at Shifty Schiff. Take a look at what he did. He made up my conversation. And then we dropped the transcript, and he almost had a heart attack. Didn't he say eight quid pro quos? Think of it. So eight times I said the same thing, according to Shifty Schiff. If I ever did that, so you say it once. Now you say it again. We're talking about a man that I've never even met before. Now you say it a third time. A fourth time, a fifth time, sixth time, seventh time, eight times, eight times, he said that I asked for the exact same thing in one call. If, after the third time, uh, they'd have to take you away, okay? He's a sick person. Schiff is a very corrupt politician, and he's a sick person. So he made up, totally made up, and because he shielded, which a lot of people didn't know, but because he's shielded by the halls of Congress, you know, in terms of what he says, you can say anything you want. He made up a story. It was total fiction. And then at the end, he said, don't call me, I'll call you. That's a mob statement. Very famous statement in numerous movies, one in particular. That's a mob statement. Don't call me, I'll call you. He said that I said that. He said that I said eight times quid pro quo. Well, there were no times quid pro quo, nothing. Uh, that whole thing was corrupt and a disgrace. And Romney's a disgrace for voting against. He's a disgrace. Okay, uh, anybody else? Can I ask you to elaborate a little bit more on stopping first? It's going to be a big issue in the coming days. Do you support that policy? And is it, as you said in the tweet? We anything we can do to get down crime and to get rid of drugs. But I think when a man is with stop and frisk his whole life, and then he decides to go Democrat, and he goes to a church, and he's practically crying. It looked like hell. He's practically crying saying how what a horrible thing he did. I think that's so disingenuous. You know what I'm talking about, fellas. That was so of Bloomberg. Look, he's a lightweight. He's a lightweight. You're going to find that out. He's also one of the worst debaters I've ever seen. And his presence is zero. So he'll spend his three, four, five hundred million dollars. Maybe they will take it away. Frankly, I'd rather run against Bloomberg than Bernie Sanders, because Sanders has real followers. Whether you like him or not, whether you agree with him or not, I happen to think it's terrible what he says. But he has followers. Bloomberg's just buying his way in. Uh, but we're going to find out what happens. We're going to find out. But when you watch, go back to the church where he apologized for everything he ever did practically, and he looked pathetic. Our country doesn't need that kind of leadership. Thank you all very much. What do you think of the Biden campaign? Uh, it's stumbling. It's mumbling. Not pretty. But we'll see how he does. You never know. You never know. The only time you knew for sure was the Trump campaign. Trump was going to win. Do you think he could turn it around in South Carolina? He could always turn it around. You know, I think it's not going to be easy. Uh, I think he can turn it around, yeah. I think he has a shot. He's got probably almost as good a shot as anyone, but uh, he's going to have to work. He's going to have to work very hard, much harder than they thought. Don't forget, when he first ran, I called him 1% Joe, because every time he ran, he only got 1%. And then Obama took him off the uh, garbage heap. But he only got 1%, right, John? You know that. 1% Joe, but now he's, uh, what, 19% Joe? It's better. He's doing better. He's made a lot of progress. But it's going to be, it's going to be very interesting. I think we have, we're going to have a very interesting Democrat race. And I think we're going to have a very interesting election. But. Our country is doing better than it's ever done. We've rebuilt our military thanks to the people back here. We've taken care of our vets at a level that they've never been taken care of before. They've been never even close. And uh, it's really something that we're very proud of. You look at the economy. I mean, we have the best economy we've ever had. 
We have the best employment numbers we've ever had, African-American, Asian-American, Hispanic-American. Uh, we're going to protect our Second Amendment. The Democrats want to take away the guns. They want to take away everyone's gun. They want to destroy the Second Amendment. So when you add it all up, you know, I don't see how we lose, but you never know. It's politics, right, fellas? Thank you all very much. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. 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 President, outstanding. Thank you very much. Good job. Good standing. Great work. It's ready to do it because they've actually done it in real life. And this is important for them and this is important for their families. It's a great step forward. And you've done a great job. You know, we're constantly, I shouldn't say this to these people, but you used to in the old days, in all fairness, before Trump, but always for a little while until we got choice and accountability done. Every night, there'd be stories, these horror stories about the vet, you know, the VA. And you'd have these horrible stories. Now it's running so well, and I want to thank you for the great job you've done. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You're not finished. You have a lot of plans, and uh, I know that. Thank you very much. Uh, Kevin, how about you? Well, I would just say I think it's interesting that you point out the mega companies, and these are some of the companies that are going to be looking for the type of talent that mm -hmm. this program is going right. to help encourage. And it's great when you have a booming economy, but the biggest challenge is the workforce. And here you're merging a supply and a demand and more supply, which is, I think, a winning situation all the way around. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Kevin won a race that was unwinnable. The opponent he beat was unbeatable. They said the only one, man that might do it, we discussed it, John, yeah, is Kevin Kramer. And uh, couldn't get him to do it. Finally, he decided to do it. His wife is an incredible woman, and he decided to do it. And I think you won by, like, 12 points or something, right? Every time you talk, it gets a little better. So. <laughs> <laughs> he won by a lot. It was 11. It was 11. 11? Well, that's not good. That was, that's not too bad. Anyway, well, a great job, and we appreciate it. You've been fantastic, uh, really fantastic. John, please. Well, absolutely. There's a real shortage in these areas. So we're talking science, technology, energy, or, uh, engineering, mathematics. And so th this is a double win, right? This is a win for our veterans, and this is a win for our economy because we need people in these professions. In North Dakota, we're a big ag state. We're a big energy state. We're tying it together with technology. What better way to do it than to help our vets get this STEM education and then get them in these great jobs? Again, double win for our veterans, for our economy. And you're a great football state, too. Right? <laughs> <laughs> bison. Thank Go you. Bison. Absolutely. Thank you. Hey, Jerry, why don't you say something? We'll uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, first, let me thank you from even before you're being sworn in. You prioritized uh, veterans. Uh, you promised that you would serve those who served our country as a president of the United States, and uh, you have done so. Uh, you have been a, a champion for those who served our nation. And your secretary, Secretary Wilkie, has been a great ally in that regard. He is somebody that we appreciate working with. I'm honored now to chair the Senate Veterans Committee. I will do my best to, to uh, do my duty to those who served. It's an honor to stand here beside those who not only serve their country, but now spend their time serving other veterans. And so uh, we're a team, and we'll work hard to make certain that those who served our nation get the respect. This particular bill, anytime we can provide jobs, uh, economic opportunity, for veterans, we're doing something certainly good, but as our committee focuses on mental health and suicide, one of the best things that can happen to someone uh, who is in the community, uh, somebody who has returned home from battle, is to be a part of that community and earning a living and the self-esteem and the, the, the joy that comes from having a job uh, helps us in all our battles in trying to make sure that every veteran, every place in the country has a bright future, that they're living the American dream. So thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Jerry. Would you be making some adjust, uh, little adjustments one way or the other to Veterans Choice? Do you see that happening over a period of time? Mr. President, we held a hearing uh, last week in front of uh, our committee in which we had uh, the Deputy Secretary with us to talk about its implementation. We want to do oversight and make sure that it's being done in a way that meets the needs of these uh, men and women uh, and the veterans they serve. Fantastic. So, yes. Thank you, thank you. Appreciate thank you very it very much. much. Uh, Mike Pence, please. 
Well, I don't think there's ever been a president in my lifetime who's done more for the men and women who've worn the uniform of the United States uh, than President Donald Trump. And today is just the latest installment, Mr. President, keeping the promises you made to the American people. In 2016, we've reformed the VA uh, through veterans' choice and through accountability. 8,000 people no longer at the VA because they weren't providing the level of care that you demanded. Uh, but these members of the House and the Senate, Chairman Moran, uh, have a heart for our veterans. Um, and uh, today is just one more installment uh, in your commitment and the American people's commitment to make sure that those who served our nation, uh, they are our nation's best, get America's best. So thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mike, very much. Thank you very much, fellas. Please, go ahead. Mr. President, as a, as a veteran of the war in Afghanistan, your veteran record, as the Vice President said, is second to none. I mean, from accountability at the VA uh, to the largest investment in modernizing electronic health records, on top of everything else that your administration has done, you're always going to be known as the veteran's president. And I, as a younger veteran of the uh, my job is Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, you mentioned the hearing today with the Federal Reserve. Right. And what we heard today was with this Trump economy, we have over 7 million more job openings in America than we have unemployed Americans. And many of those job openings are in the STEM fields. And so, as was mentioned before, this is a, a twofer. We get to fill these STEM vacancies with the best and brightest our country has to offer these veteran heroes. And at the same time, we get to fill uh, these jobs, these employer jobs. And this follows on the other bill that you signed last year that enhanced the, uh, uh, the forever GI bill right. that provides <coughs> st STEM scholarships for these heroes. So thank you. Thank you very much. Right. And Mr. President, uh, I, as a veteran and also as the ranking member on the science, uh, uh, the subcommittee on space and aeronautics, uh, I can tell you we appreciate your leadership and I agree that uh, you have been really the most pro-vet president that I've seen in, in my, my lifetime. And I just want to thank, thank my you. colleagues that have introduced this bill and I was proud to, uh, to be a, a co-sponsor of it. and. Uh, STEM is where it's at. And if we want to catch up with our adversaries and stay ahead of them, I should say, uh, then this could, this, there's no more important uh, thing that we could be doing. Thank you for what you've done. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Promises made and promises kept. Those veterans made promise to serve our country. Candidate Trump made a promise to take care of the veterans, to rebuild our military. You've kept your promises, Mr. President. Thanks for keeping your promises. We're grateful. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Can I just say to those MAGA companies, like, talk's cheap. Yeah. You want to support your veterans, hire one. Yeah. Right? Put your money where your mouth is, hire yeah. veterans. So Microsoft, Apple, Google, and Amazon, talk is cheap in this town. Yeah. You want to support a veteran, hire one. And if we're going to keep up with the Chinese, if we're going to stay the world leader, then we have to put our best and brightest from the military and our yeah. best and brightest yeah. in the yeah. private sector. Absolutely. Great job. Yeah. Mr. President, I want to say thank you, but also I want you, the veterans here gathered to know that everybody yeah. really is pro-veteran. I mean, we, we do love you. We're proud of all the things that you've done. I'm very grateful to have had the help of virtually everybody standing here, and certainly Secretary Wilkie, to introduce this bill. I want to call out a few people who also deserve credit for that. One, Senator Marco Rubio. Another mm -hmm. is Representative Alexander Lamar, who is no longer, um, uh, Lamar Alexander, who's no longer with us. Uh, he's in 2018, he was in the House, and he helped me author that bill. And uh, also our Democrat co-sponsor, Connor Lamb. Uh, on was on that and helped us get it across uh, the floor this time. So it's a it's a real win for the veterans. I'm a veteran too. I want to let closely say to uh, Secretary Wilkie, I've spent the last two days on the Mission Act and VA. I'm ranking member of VA Health, and I have had two great days with uh, with the VA. I mean, a lot of great improvements for our veterans in health. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you, you Mr. President. Thank, Thank you very you, much. Would anybody like to say you're the ones that really right. should be speaking up? Would you like to say something? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Please. President. Go ahead. You know, no one knows more than veterans. The American Legion supports, obviously, our nation and our veterans, and no one knows more than veterans than uh, what it takes to, to be technologically advanced. Mm -hmm. And they have the, the greatest stake in making sure that our country 
is at the forefront of technology when it comes to their weapon systems, when it comes to their inf information technology, and when it comes to cybersecurity. So this is really a win for, for every veteran that's out there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please. Thank you. On behalf of Hiring Our Heroes, thank you to you and to your administration for what you have done. I want to point out this isn't only an opportunity for us to provide paths into uh, STEM for veterans. It's also an opportunity for us to welcome a chronically underemployed and unemployed population in our military spouses and put them to work by upskilling and reskilling them. So thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Please go ahead. Well, as we continue to work to bridge the civilian military divide in the business community and help build America's workforce with the best and the brightest, um, you know, reiterating what Liz said, this provides that opportunity to allow the veterans to upskill into what the current roles are, along with, um, you know, the, the support of the military spouses and employment. Thank so, you. Thank Great you. job. Thank you very much. Folks? Mr. President, just a big thank you. Student Veterans of America is representing nearly a million veterans who are in college using their GI Bill right now. And the top three majors that veterans are pursuing in college this moment are business, just like yourself, as well as science, technology, engineering, and math, and health-related fields. So as we look at this post-9-11 era, uh, those veterans who have served in Iraq and Afghanistan, we are looking at the most educated generation of veterans because of the solid GI Bill that you have improved with the Forever GI Bill, as well as the members here have extended, and the great leadership of Secretary Wilkie uh, to implement this law. Uh, this is a great opportunity to help transitioning service members enter the workforce and to continue to educate our youth uh, through K through 12 education uh, in the STEM fields. So just an all around win and thank you, Mr. President. Great job, thank you very much. Mr. Please. President, uh, veterans <coughs> experience unique challenges and unique solutions are, are often required to, to remedy that. So thank you, thank you, Senator Wil thank you, uh, Secretary Wilkie, for uh, pursuing policies that allow veterans to, to live healthy, prosperous lives after service. Thank you very much. Thank Great you. job. Great job, everybody. So let's do the signing, right? All right. Did you see a man named uh, Chuck Grassley. You don't get better than Chuck, right? <laughs> That's great. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Just pass them out. So thank you very much. It's a great honor, and we'll just do this because some people like to see this. You see that, fellas? Okay. I don't know. They're going to ask questions, but it might not be on this subject. It should be on this subject. Go ahead. Ask, ask on. Ask on stem cells. Oh, I'm shocked. <laughs> I'm shocked. You seem from your tweet saying that you were upset about the Roger Stone sentencing. Yeah, I thought it was ridiculous Did that, you that of that. No, I didn't speak to the judge. I'd be able to do it if I wanted. I have the absolute right to do it. Uh, I stay out of things uh, to a degree that people wouldn't believe, but I didn't speak to him. I thought the recommendation was ridiculous. I thought the whole prosecution was ridiculous. And I look at others that haven't been prosecuted, or I don't know where it is now. But when you see that, I thought it was an insult to our country, and it shouldn't happen. And uh, we'll see what what goes on there. But uh, that was a uh, that was a horrible aberration. Uh, these are the I guess the the same Mueller people that put everybody through hell, and uh, I think it's a disgrace. No, I have not been involved with it at all. Would you consider commuting? Or I don't want to talk about that now. I think it was a disgraceful recommendation. What do you think they ought to be ashamed of themselves. What they've done to General Flynn, what they've done to others, and then the really guilty ones, people that have committed major crimes are getting away with it. Uh, I think it's a disgrace. Let's see what happens. Go ahead, John. I was just going to say, Mr. President, you took on uh, Michael Bloomberg and Brad Parscale did as well over stop and frisk. Yet in 2016 and 2018, you praised Rudy Giuliani for the stop and frisk program. So what's different about what Bloomberg said and what you believe is right. Well, I'll tell you what, I looked at it and I watched him pander at a church and practically beg for forgiveness. I wouldn't have begged for forgiveness. I mean, he was doing his job at the time. And then he, when he went up to the church, uh, I thought it was disgraceful. Uh, but I put something out and it was so, it was pretty nasty. And I thought, you know, I'm looking to bring the country together, not divide the country further. But 
uh, when he went up to a church and he apologized for everything he's ever done, that was only for getting votes. And I think probably people understand that. Yeah, please. I am. I just spoke with uh, Prime Minister Modi, and it's going to be very — I don't know who's going, but it's — he said we will have millions and millions of people. My only problem is — so last night, we probably had 40 or 50,000 people, far more than anyone else. But when we have 50,000 people nowadays, fellas, I'm not going to feel so good, because he thinks we'll have 5 to 7 million people just from the airport to the uh, — to the new stadium. And you know, it's the largest stadium in the world. He's building it now. It's almost complete. And it's the largest in the world. And he's a friend of mine. He's a great gentleman. And I look forward to going to India. So we'll be going at the end of the month. Do you plan to sign a trade deal with the Indians? Uh, they want to do something, and we'll see if we can make the right deal. We'll do it. Mr. President, do, do you know who Anonymous is? Uh, I don't want to say. Uh, but you'd be surprised. Would you be surprised? But I don't want to say. Hey, hey, can you talk a little bit more about some of the recent departures from the White House, including the Dinman twins? And no, the well, I, I, yeah, I obviously wasn't happy with the job he did. First of all, he reported a false call that wasn't what was said on the call. What was said on the call was totally appropriate, and I call it a perfect call. I always will call it a perfect call. Uh, and it wasn't one call. It was two calls. There were two perfect calls. Uh, there was no setup. There was no anything. And he reported it totally differently. And then they all went wild when I said that we have transcripts of the calls. And they turned out to be totally accurate transcripts. And if anybody felt there was any changes, we let them make it, because it didn't matter. Uh, so we had accurate, totally accurate transcripts. And it turned out that what he reported was very different. And also, when you look at Vindman's, uh, the person he reports to, said horrible things, avoided the chain of command, leaked. Uh, did a lot of bad things. And so we sent him on his way to a much different location, and uh, the military can handle him any way they want. Uh, General Milley has him now. I congratulate General Milley. Uh, he can have him. Uh, but uh, — and his brother also. So we'll — we'll find out what happened. I mean, we'll find out. But he reported uh, very inaccurate things. You understand that, John. When you look at his report, and then when you look at what actually the exact words Fortunately, I had the words, because otherwise we would have had a lot of people lying, and uh, we were able to do it. So fortunately, we had transcripts of those calls. I think you guys all agree with that, right? Yes, Wasn't it nice? After they said these horrible things and made up these horrible, horrible lies about what was said in the call, and then I said, here's the call. I had a transcript. If I didn't have a transcript, it would have been my word against their word. But there were other people on that call, too, many people on that call, Mike Pompeo, and I know that when I speak to the head of state of countries, presidents, prime ministers, etc., there are always a lot of people on those calls, especially from the other countries. I imagine I don't know that for a fact, but I know for a fact that we have a lot of people on those calls. Who would say something wrong? I wouldn't say it wrong anyway, but who would say wrong when you have when a call is loaded up with, you know, sometimes as many as 25 people, sometimes as as many as three or four or two, but there's always people on those calls. I I fully know that. Uh, but that was a perfect call, and it wasn't reported the way it was reported, like, oh, it was so terrible. That was a very nice call. That was a very friendly call. Uh, a couple of things. The President, as you know, of, of Ukraine stated very strongly that there was no pressure. There was no anything. There was nothing wrong. And uh, it was really a very sad state of affairs that our country wasted that much time on nothing or nothing. And I want to thank our three senators that are here for, for <coughs> agreeing with me. I mean, you had one grandstander. He's always been a grandstander. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Absolutely. There always are. When you say that the military can deal with Inman any way that they want, I guess. Well, that's up to them. He's he is now a, he's, he is over with the military. Do you think he needs to face disciplinary? Uh, that's going to be up to the military. We'll have to see. But, if you look at what happened, I mean, they're going to certainly, I would imagine, take a look at that. But, no, I think uh, what he did was just reported a false call. If you look at what he said, and then — and I'll tell you, you the one worse was uh, you look at Shifty Schiff. Take a look at what he did. He made up my conversation. And then we dropped the transcript, and he almost had a heart attack. Didn't he say eight quid pro quos? Think of it. So eight times I said the same thing, according to Shifty Shiv. If I ever did that — so you say it once. Now you say it again. We're talking about a man that I've never even met before. Now you say it a third time, a fourth time, a fifth time, a sixth time, seventh time, eight times, eight times. 
He said that I asked for the exact same thing in one call. After the third time, uh, they'd have to take you away, okay? He's a sick person. Schiff is a very corrupt politician, and he's a sick person. So he made up, totally made up. And because he shielded, which a lot of people didn't know, but because he's shielded by the halls of Congress, you know, in terms of what he says, you can say anything you want. He made up a story. It was total fiction. And then at the end, he said, don't call me, I'll call you. That's a mob statement. Very famous statement in numerous movies, one in particular. That's a mob statement. Don't call me, I'll call you. He said that I said that. He said that I said eight times quid pro quo. Well, there were no times quid pro quo, nothing. Uh, that whole thing was corrupt and a disgrace. And Romney's a disgrace for voting against. He's a disgrace. Okay, uh, anybody else? Can I just ask you to, to elaborate a little bit more on stop and frisk? It's going to be a big issue in the coming days. Do you support that policy? And is it, as you said in a tweet? Anything we can do to get down crime and to get rid of drugs. But I think when a man is with stop and frisk his whole life, and then he decides to go Democrat, and he goes to a church, and he's practically crying. It looked like hell. He's practically crying saying how, what a horrible thing he did. I think that's so disingenuous. You know what I'm talking about, fellas. That was so of Bloomberg. Look, he's a lightweight. He's a lightweight. You're going to find that out. He's also one of the worst debaters I've ever seen. And his presence is zero. So he'll spend his three, four, five hundred million dollars. Maybe they will take it away. Frankly, I'd rather run against Bloomberg than Bernie Sanders, because Sanders has real followers. Whether you like him or not, whether you agree with him or not, I happen to think it's terrible what he says. But he has followers. Bloomberg's just buying his way in. Uh, but we're going to find out what happens. We're going to find out. But when you watch, go back to the church where he apologized for everything he ever did practically, and he looked pathetic. Our country doesn't need that kind of leadership. Thank you all very much. Thanks for watching the campaign. It's stumbling, it's mumbling. Not pretty. But we'll see how he does. You never know. You never know. The only time you knew for sure was the Trump campaign. Trump was going to win. Do you think he could turn it around in South Carolina? He could always turn it around. You know, I think it's not going to be easy. Uh, I think he can turn it around, yeah. I think he has a shot. He's got probably almost as good a shot as anyone, but uh, he's going to have to work. He's going to have to work very hard, much harder than they thought. Don't forget, when he first ran, I called him 1 percent Joe, because every time he ran, he only got 1 percent. And then Obama took him off the uh, garbage heap. But he only got 1 percent. Right, John? You know that. 1 percent Joe. But now he's, uh, what, 19 percent Joe? It's better. He's doing better. He's made a lot of progress. But it's going to be, it's going to be very interesting. I think we have — we're going to have a very interesting Democrat race, and I think we're going to have a very interesting election. But. Our country is doing better than it's ever done. We've rebuilt our military thanks to the people back here. We've taken care of our vets at a level that they've never been taken care of before. Jerry been never even close. And uh, it's really something that we're very proud of. You look at the economy. I mean, we have the best economy we've ever had. We have the best employment numbers we've ever had. African-American, Asian-American, Hispanic-American. Uh, we're going to protect our Second Amendment. The Democrats want to take away the guns. They want to take away everyone's gun. They want to destroy the Second Amendment. So when you add it all up, you know, I don't see how we lose, but you never know. It's politics, right, fellas? Thank you all very much. Congrats, Thank you, Congrats. 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 everybody. Out this way. Congrats. 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 Congrats.